are um, somebody who shies away from publicity. I've been trying to get you to come on the show for years. So has Andrew. So we are thrilled to have you here today. The greatest investors aren't the ones you see on television or the internet every week telling you which stocks you should buy. In fact, the best investors don't even work in the financial centre of the world. They want to be as far away from the clouded judgement of Wall Street as possible, such as in the sleepy town of Omaha, Nebraska, or, as is the case with Seth Klarman, Boston, Massachusetts. After not saying a word in the media for over a decade, the so-called Oracle of Boston broke his silence on the investing philosophy that he's used to produce one of the best investment track records of all time, and how it applies in the current economic environment that he calls the everything bubble. Now, I do wanna just pause the video quickly to talk about today's sponsor, Magic Mind, a daily productivity shot that I've been trying over the past few weeks. I credit the majority of the success that I've had here on YouTube, as well as in the field of investing, not to any particular book or any technique that I learned, but to my morning routine and other productivity improvements that I've been able to make in my life. The biggest obstacle in your way is often yourself. And for me personally, every time I've been able to improve my diet or my sleep, my business has done better. And recently, Magic Mind has been a part of that process. The shot contains nootropics such as L-theanine found in matcha, which helps to increase focus and attention. I drink it alongside my morning coffee, and one of the effects that I've noticed is that it helps to reduce the caffeine crash that happens in the afternoon. And by reducing that crash, I've actually been able to cut out all caffeine after midday, which has been really good for improving my sleep. So if you struggle with cutting out that afternoon coffee or energy drink, Magic Mind could be a good part of your morning routine. If you'd like to try it, go to magicmind.com forward slash Hamish20 to get 20% off and they have a 100% money back guarantee. So if you want to try it risk-free, you can. And if you don't like it, you'll get a refund. No questions asked. I was business oriented as a kid. Seth Klarman grew up in New York City and from a young age, he clearly had a hunger for the business world. I tell the story that when I was maybe three or four years old, we were still living in New York City actually at the time. And I redecorated my room and set it up like it was a retail store and put price tags on all my stuff. In the fifth grade, Seth did a class presentation on how a person could invest in a company by purchasing publicly traded stocks. I, I bought my first stock when I was 10 years old. Um, I bought one share of Johnson & Johnson uh, with birthday money and it split three for one the next day. As he got older, he was involved in a number of light businesses, such as running paper routes and shoveling snow. His passion for mathematics and business led him to study economics at Cornell University, New York, followed by completing his MBA at Harvard Business School alongside the likes of Jamie Dimon. After graduating from Harvard in 1982, he, alongside a Harvard professor and some others, founded the hedge fund Baupost Group. What started with $27 million provided by Harvard professor William Porvu has grown into one of the biggest hedge funds in the world, with $25 billion of assets under management on the back of 25% per year compounded returns since inception. When I asked Warren Buffett at one point, like people who could beat the market, there's probably about five people who could actually beat the markets over time, and you're one of the names that he that he listed on that. Klarman is one of the most underrated investors of all time, largely because he chooses to stay out of the media. But this month, he finally sat down for an interview for the first time in over a decade. You see, Klarman's value investing philosophy largely originated from the century-old teachings of a man named Benjamin Graham. Graham ran his own investment partnership and taught investment analysis at Columbia. And he wrote a textbook called Security Analysis, which is now widely known as the Bible of Value Investing. The key philosophies in the book are timeless, but over the years, there has had to be changes made to the book. And for the second time in a row, Seth Klarman is the one editing it. What is the common thread um, that kind of ties all of this together and how you look at the market? One of the things I really admire about Graham and, and Dodd writing almost 90 years ago is they, they knew they were in an unusual environment being in the enmeshed in the Great Depression, and yet they tried to write something for the ages. They said, we know this won't be the permanent condition, but we don't know what conditions we will experience. So I think every investor has that challenge that you have to look at the moment you're in and say, which part of this is real, which part of this may be enduring, and which part of this may look completely different as soon as tomorrow, and how do I position myself maintaining somewhat of a longer-term perspective 
because I think trying to trade day to day is not a game anybody really is well equipped to win. Klarman's approach to investing is significantly different from the mainstream approach used by fund managers on Wall Street. Mainstream investment strategies are predicated on the idea that markets are incredibly efficient. Market efficiency refers to how well prices reflect all available information. In a highly efficient market, it's not possible to make excess profits without taking excess risk. Or in other words, if you were to make excess returns in the stock market, in a highly efficient market, it wouldn't be because you had any informational or some other kind of edge, it would basically be down to luck. The hypothesis of market efficiency stems from the idea that millions of investors and traders are voting every day with their money, buying and selling stocks based on publicly available information, and acting in a rational manner. In such a world, the stock price of a business would always reflect its current value. And the hypothesis also creates another assumption that volatility is a demonstration of risk. If a stock's price is always a reflection of all the publicly available information, but the stock price moves up and down violently over short periods of time, then the company's value is extremely sensitive, which means it's risky. These assumptions form the basis of the CAPM financial model used by professional investors to determine which stocks to buy and sell for their clients. The model was created by William Sharp, who went on to win a Nobel Prize for his financial models in 1990. The only problem is the model doesn't work. The biggest flaw in the model is the assumption that price movements in either direction, up or down, are equally risky. They are not because stock returns are not normally distributed. But to prevent this video from becoming a statistics lesson, the most important concept to understand is that volatility likely doesn't reflect the risk of a stock because of Wall Street's extremely short time horizon. Professional money managers are under constant pressure from client expectations. Most funds afford clients the ability to withdraw their funds relatively quickly, so to avoid losing clients and therefore their management fees, they're forced to aim for good short-term performance, even if it comes at the cost of long-term performance. We're about to see companies report their second quarter earnings over the next few weeks, and you'll notice that it isn't uncommon for a stock to move up or down 10% or even more after the release of these reports. That is to say that if a business misses Wall Street expectations for performance over a 90-day period, the so-called efficiently valued stock has a change in its value of more than 10% in a day. Value investors like Klarman don't believe that these sharp movements are a reflection of risk, but rather a reflection of short-term investor expectations, which often has nothing to do with the quality of the business over the long term. So for sure, there's more money in public markets, things have become somewhat more efficient. But I also see a short-term orientation that tells me that it's possible some pricing has actually become less efficient. I think when you look at Meta, uh, the stock's been all over the place in, in a reasonably short period of time, um, falling to under 100, then rising back up to almost 300, li literally months apart, um, for a large, well-established company that I think everybody can analyze. So I think that there are opportunities. According to Klarman, a stock's price isn't always the same as its actual value. So if you can consistently purchase stocks at prices far below their real value, you can, over the long term, make excess profits in the stock market. So what is the value of a stock? Well, it's simply the total of the company's future earnings power. How much profit will the company produce for shareholders over its remaining life? Some of that profit is being produced today, but it also includes expansions that the company might make, such as launching new products in the future or selling in new countries or regions. But maybe the biggest lesson Klarman teaches is about finding your own edge. I think you have to almost run harder to stay in place, that you have more competitors, smarter competitors, more information is available at everybody's fingertips. Investors need edge to be successful. They need to think about what is it they know or how are they structured that will allow them to outperform. There are millions of investors trying to pick the correct stocks, so it is an incredibly competitive field. You only have an advantage if you pick a small pocket of the market and become an expert in it. That could be an industry, a business model, or even a country. Look for the most inefficient pockets in the world. I do think there are opportunities, but people should ask themselves, what, what are my interests? What kind of edge might I have? If, if you're from a different country, 
Maybe you have great contacts in that country. Maybe you know a lot about the business culture in that country. And because of Wall Street's short-term focus, from time to time, you see a baby thrown out with the bathwater. You can find opportunities in around the edges of what other people are doing. Finding situations that other people are throwing out, like the baby with the bathwater, and they exist. It's, you have to be patient, they're not always there. But when they're there, they can be particularly attractive because the markets can become quite frenetic these days. In 2020, restaurant chains in the US got hit hard by pandemic restrictions and lockdowns. And rightfully so, many restaurant stocks declined 70 or 80% because they had debts, were burning cash, and were near bankruptcy. But good chains got pulled down too. Texas Roadhouse, a chain with the best countrywide reviews I've ever seen, with no debt and not burning cash, still fell over 50%. The stock has tripled in price since then, and it's not because the value has tripled, it's because Wall Street's short-term expectations have shifted. What changed so drastically that you felt needed to be adjust, ad addressed over the last 15 years? The first thing is we've been in an everything bubble, I think. Klarman describes the recent market conditions as an everything bubble, where money has been flowing rapidly in all areas of the financial markets, making it difficult to find undervalued businesses. That um, a lot of money has flowed into virtually everything, um, historically low interest rates, even zero rates have um, precipitated that bubble. Um, you've also had a lot of changes in the business world. Technology has um, accelerated, if anything, and you've seen disruption of all kinds of businesses, which creates challenges and opportunities for investors. The internet revolution of the past 25 years has caused huge shifts in the stock market. Almost all the big companies in the world today have been built with internet at their core, and that level of disruption has created a huge opportunity for some investors and destroyed the portfolios of investors on the wrong side of change. So I do spend time thinking about technology and Part of that, at least, is to avoid being on the wrong side, to avoid being in a company that gets disrupted. Value investing is hard, and it's something that most people just won't want to participate in. But while there isn't a perfect solution, index funds do provide a way for the novice investor to participate in the markets. You know, I, 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 the argument for index funds is that you're going to have low transaction costs near zero, and you're going to have um, exposure to the market. You're not going to underperform the market but neither will you outperform the market. I think for um, the average person out there who isn't um, terribly sophisticated um, and is able to take a long-term view, I don't see anything wrong with index funds. A reminder to check out Magic Mind's daily productivity shots. Head to magicmind.com forward slash Hamish20 for 20% off your order.